doing that? I know it all day. People are really, it's a good talk, they're fat, I like it. So, let me tell you, there are a couple of reasons why I asked you to do that. I'm going to reveal those as we go along. I don't know about you, but when I go to a training, I like to sit in the very back and do nothing. That is the most work you're going to have to do, I promise. And there's a reason for it. But before I get to the reason, I'm going to ask for a couple volunteers. Just raise your hand if you'll share with the larger group the physical injury that you just spoke about a moment ago. Can I get someone? Yes. I dove on a slip and slide that didn't have water on it, and I popped my shoulder out. Okay, thank you. Someone else? Yes. I was hit by a metal metal barrel cover over my eye, and it's very great. Okay, and we'll take one more. One more. Someone else, help me out. Yes. Um, I was about three. I played Chase Me, Chase Me around and around a friend's house, and he thought it would be fun. He closed his living room door, and I kept going. My hand went right through the glass. Oh. Okay. I still have the scar. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Sorry for all your injuries. There's a reason I asked you to do that. When I asked you to do that, I noticed people were smiling and laughing. They hadn't remembered that in a long, long time. They were sharing it. It was pretty easy to do. And I asked you to talk about a mental health challenge that you had, your child has, or someone that you love has. That would be unfair. I would never ask you to do it. But a physical challenge, a physical injury, and a mental health injury or challenge are much more similar than we know. We just treat them very differently. Think about this. If I'm walking in this library and I have a broken leg, people are opening up the door. Can I help you, John? Can I carry your backpack? But if I'm walking in here and I have anxiety, people don't, can't see it, feel it, know it, touch it in the same way. They wouldn't know what to say. And even if they did know that I had it, like how do you respond to something like that? But tonight we're going to ask you to try to look at physical limita uh, limitations and physical challenges and mental health challenges in much more similar ways that uh, maybe you have in the past. We're going to start out really slow. We're going to talk about stress. Raise your hand if you've been stressed out at all in the last two months. Everyone's happy to talk about stress. Not a big deal. Uh, we're happy to talk about it. There's no stigma around stress. We talk about it all the time and there's a good reason why we do it. Of course, there are a lot of factors that stress us out. None of these will surprise you, the things that stress us out. One of the things that might surprise you is that stress for young people is different than it is for adults. And I'm going to play a video. I know the volume is going to be kind of low, so everyone's going to have to maybe sit forward and we'll see if we can't have everyone hear this, which will really illustrate some of the differences uh, between uh, stress for young people and stress for older people. What's up, YouTube? So I recently read a study where they looked at the amount of stress that people experience in their life, and they found that teenagers reported experiencing a significantly greater degree of severe stress than did adults. And a lot of adults question this study because they say, how many teenagers experience more stress than us? Because they have their financial responsibilities, they have their own life, the product of that. But to me, this study made a lot of sense because, yes, although teenagers might experience less financial responsibility than do adults, one of the major factors of stress for human beings is the degree of control that they feel over their lives. And if you look at teenagers versus the rest of their lives as adults, being a teenager is the time in your life when you will experience the least amount of control over your life. Let's look at the five biggest decisions of your life and how as a teenager you have almost no control over any of them. Number one, you have very little control over who you hang out with because those things are largely determined by where you live and what school you go to. And you might have parents who try to outlaw you from hanging out with certain groups of people. For example, maybe you want to date a Capulet, but your parents are super monogue you and they're all like, I'm not going to let you date that person except I'm going to talk in any other vocabulary and you're not going to understand any of the things I'm saying to you. Number two, you can't control who you live with because this is generally based on who your parents marry and how many babies they have. Unless your parents are coming to you like, hey, do you think we should have more babies? In which case you're probably like, oh, way too much information. I do not want to be involved in this discussion at all. Number three, what you do with your time. As a teenager, you are required by law to be in school for certain hours per day, and then your teachers give you homework that you have no control over how much there is, and then you get your YouTube creators create content, and you must watch it. And if you're into daily vloggers, then you get behind after a couple days of doing homework, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I've got hours of YouTube to catch up on. Number four, where you go. In the little free time that you do have, you have limited options as to where you go during that time because of the big three C's. Number one, the curfew that your parents or city establishes for you. Number two, the city that you live in doesn't have public transportation options for you as a teenager for getting around. And number three, related to that, is 
the car that you may or may not have access to, or whether you are even old enough to have a driver's license. Number five, where you live. This can be really tough, especially if you live in a small town where there's just not a lot of stuff to do. Maybe you want to find a boyfriend or girlfriend, but there's only like 10 potential people you can date in your school, and they're already dating someone. So you have to decide between being single or dating your cousin. So this one, I think the blue container is in fact very stressful. It's extremely simple to solve all these problems. All you have to do is wait a couple of years, and there's a 100% chance that you will so you can see it's about control. It's really about control, and teens at this stage of their life don't have a lot of control. So that's why it's really stressful. Anxiety and the word anxiety and stress and those terms are used interchangeably, but they're very different. And I want to tell you how I remember. So that tiger's in front of you is going to eat you, that's just damn stressful. Anxiety means someone is taking care of that tiger. That tiger can't hurt you in any way. But you can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't have joy. That's what anxiety is. And it's incredible when we think about anxiety, uh, and we think about stigma with anxiety. I'm not going to ask you, but if I ask people about, wow, have you experienced an anxiety disorder, severe anxiety, not as many people would feel comfortable. I totally get that. Yet 25% of young people, 25%, Will, have an, will be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. It's really incredible when you think about it, and uh, we're going to talk about that um, a little bit later. So um, anxiety is normal. Having a little bit of anxiety is normal. Raise your hand if you know of anyone, not you, know of anyone who suffers with anxiety. Yeah, so just about everyone here does. Um, and I always think about this around anxiety. When anxiety competes with virtually anything else in your life, and I, when I say anxiety, I'm talking about out of control, it will always win. If you're a really good athlete, but you suffer with anxiety, you're a marginal athlete. If you're a really smart kid, and you'll do well in that test, but your anxiety kicks in, that anxiety takes over. So anxiety really can be very crippling for people. And of course, there are different sorts of anxieties. Um, so generalized anxiety disorder, just the excessive worry. Um, social phobia. Um, so I know someone who has social phobia, and um, they said to me, I definitely have social phobia because I went online on Google and I have all the characteristics. I said, all right, there's a problem right there. I said, well, what do you mean you have social phobia? Oh, before I go to a party, I get nervous. I said, that is called normal. I said, do you go to the party? She said, of course. Who doesn't like going to a party? Someone who has social phobia desperately wants to go to that party, but can't go. And then she says, but you don't understand. When I get to the party, I have to go and have a drink in my hand. She's over 21. Have a drink in my hand, or I get too anxious. I said, that is quote normal. Again, someone who has social phobia desperately want, wants to get to that party. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Raise your hand if you know someone who suffers with that. Yeah, so OCD, um, the obsessive part in your brain, the compulsion to do it. Now, typically at home, my kids are not living at home anymore. You know, when you're a therapist, Dad, you just drive your kids out so quickly. They don't want to live there anymore. Um, so um, my wife and I are in bed, and one of us will say, oh, did we turn the heat down? Did we lock the door? Going and checking once means you're just getting old and you forgot. If I went down every 15 minutes, someone who had OCD would check every 15 minutes would not be sleeping, that's when it's a problem. Shane Larkin, who played for the Celtics, you might remember last year he was on the bench for the Celtics, no problem in terms of playing in front of 18,000 people in the garden, but his OCD was around washing his hands. He would go home and wash his hands so much until they bled. And if you don't really understand about OCD, you're not familiar with it, you say, why would someone do that? That seems like it doesn't make sense to me. Something in that person's brain is telling them, if they don't do that, Something bad, something catastrophic will happen. Everything we do in life, we do for a reason and a good reason to us. It makes sense to the person on some level, even though it's exhausting and they don't really want to be doing it. Raise your hand if you've ever seen someone having a panic attack. Yeah, I'm not asking you for yourself. My wife has had several panic attacks. Um, and um, she actually had one recently. I hope she's not seeing this. We live in Belmont. She knows I talked about her. And here's what, here's what happens. Same thing each time. She jumps out of bed. She's in full panic mode. So my wife and I have a great relationship. I'm a good partner. I'm a therapist. So I do what I think makes sense, and I talk logically to her. How do you think that went over? <laughs> really poorly. She told me to shut up. And then she starts pacing around the top floor of our house, and I start stop start following her, and she turns, she says, stop following me. Like for one moment, she's forgot about her panic. But when you're having a panic attack, or you're seeing someone have it, it feels like you're really having a heart attack. It takes over. And uh, the best thing you can do for someone who's having a panic attack, 
let them know you're gonna just sit there or be there, that there's no time limit, and that it's okay. Because, you know, talking logically to someone, it's like you're playing tennis with someone, you're lobbing it over the net, and they're hitting it over the fence. And PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we used to think about that in terms of people who are in the service coming back. Anyone who's had a traumatic event. I was doing a teacher training in Sandwich, and one of the teachers said when she was six years old that a dog bit her right on the side of the face, and she has PTSD from it. Anything that's traumatic um, to you. Um, we recently had a death in the family, and some of our family members were carrying the casket up, and one of the younger cousins um, was ambivalent about it, and she's really struggled with a lot of PTSD over carrying it. It was just so overwhelming to her, even though she wanted to do it. Um, so here, here's some of the emotional and physical symptoms of anxiety. These are real things. These are not manufactured things, and it can feel overwhelming, especially the heart palpitations and the being dizzy and nauseous and thinking you're going to pass out um, and that sort of thing. Uh, I want to play this short video because I think it captures a little bit about what anxiety feels like. From the outside, it's easy to think that somebody's got it all figured out. Because my hair is curled and my cheeks are intentionally flushed, I must not have a care in the world. As if it were expected for my demons to be worn like a scarlet letter beating to my chest. And they assume if you cannot see it, then it's not really there. As if pain does not exist unless you're bleeding or slung in a cast or staggering with a limp. But sometimes the most painful demons are the ones they can't even see. Once you've achieved it, how can you ever get back to that? 
Um, let's talk about some of the triggers for anxiety. So um, all of you are familiar with schools who are either in school or have kids in school, have been through school. So in a school setting, what are some places or what are some events that might trigger anxiety? Anybody? What are some places in a school or activities that might trigger anxiety? Yes? The lunchroom? Yeah, cafeteria. It's loud, it's raucous. Am I going to have time to sit with my friends and eat and that sort of thing? We always think about that as a time for kids to be social. For kids who are anxious, <coughs> that is the worst moment of the day. In fact, some schools that have had um, the room for this have established quiet cafeterias where kids can go in and just sit quietly, expected to go in alone, expected just to sit there quiet, quietly. There's no stigma, there's no shame about that. Yes, where else, what other activities or places in a school might trigger anxiety? Yeah? Uh, test taking. Yeah, test taking. Or, and I do a lot of PDs, like I'll say to teachers, how many of you, when your students are taking a test, say 15 minutes left, 10 minutes left? Uh, well intentioned, completely well intentioned, these teachers. But for that anxious kid, as soon as they hear 15 minutes, they're done. <laughs> or teachers always say, when you're done the test, bring it up and put it on my desk. Guess what? If I'm processing at my own speed, Kid hands in the test, my anxiety. As soon as that kid goes up, I'm done. So schools are waking up to this also and, and doing a lot of good training. So I'm not just picking on schools. Any place can be um, a trigger. Walking in a library is a trigger for people. Any kind of public space. I know that seems irrational, but that's what anxiety is. It's not really very rational. And of course, we know some of the positive things we can do around anxiety. You know, yoga and meditation. I know when I'm anxious, I'll go in my backyard and shoot baskets. Um, we know the things we can do, but we often go to these other things because they're easier. The first list I showed you a moment ago takes planning and time and effort and sometimes money. These don't, especially for a young person who's going to gravitate towards something like drinking, drugging, self-injury, and giving themselves, I'll call it an immediate gratification, is pretty hollow. Um, they will go toward that. Let's have some fun here. If you can have fun with the anxiety, I think we can. All right, let's do this. I'm going to challenge you guys. Tell me the worst things, not the best, the worst things to say to someone who is anxious. Raise your hand. Yes. Calm down. Calm down. I love that. Thank you. Yes. You're OK. Get over it. Get over it. What else? What's the worst thing can happen? What's the worst thing? That sometimes that can be good, but oftentimes it's not so good. Yeah. Yeah, here's my favorite. It's all in your head. Of course it's all in your head. That's what anxiety is. We know the worst things to say. And as a dad and as a partner to my wife, I probably said a lot of them all well intentioned. Let's do this. Let's think for a moment about some of the best things to say. And I'm going to tell a story, even though I know I'm on cable. My son has heard me speak many times. Um, so, Jake, I hope you don't see this. <laughs> He's heard this story. So he was pretty anxious in high school, and I didn't really understand a lot about his anxiety. I'm a therapist, I'm involved in that. But I knew he was anxious, and I decided that instead of asking him how he was feeling, because if you ask anyone, young person, old person, how they feel, they'll say, oh, I'm good, I'm bad. You can't catalog it. So I asked him to give me a number every day, 10 being the worst, 1 being the best, how are you? And he would give me a number because he was happy to do that. How are you today, Jake? I'm a six, I'm an eight, that sort of thing. And when he was an eight, I could say what would have to happen for you to become a six, that sort of thing. And I knew there was a pattern, and I didn't tell him this at the time, um, but I got a calendar out. And every day when he would tell me about his anxiety, I would write it down on the calendar. Does anybody have a guess about what day was Jake's most anxious day of the week? Anybody have a guess? Sunday. 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 Yeah, I heard some Sunday. Yes, yeah, Sunday. Why? Academic challenges, social challenges. Jake was an athlete. All of those things. It reoriented how I was as a dad. I wasn't going to pester him about chores too much. I wasn't going to pester him about homework. He had his favorite meal every Sunday. My daughter, Jesse, said, how come Jake always gets his favorite meal? And I said, quiet, Jesse, like he needs it. So there was a pattern for him. Absolutely. And there are patterns for kids who are anxious, who do things maybe that they don't want to do because their anxiety is telling them to do, that sort of thing. So you might have a kid who you think is nasty or belligerent or is not listening to you. That's their anxiety speaking. Once I knew about Jake's pattern of anxiety, it got so much better because I was a better parent to it. I was more attentive to it. So if you have an anxious person in your life, Instead of just asking him, how do you feel, ask him to give it a number and think about that. You can catalog it a little bit. You know. Also, you see on that list is something called, how can I help you? Very respectful. 
when we assume we know what's going to be helpful for other people, we're making a big mistake. Um, and around anxiety, there are a couple things that um, are that we know. In fact, in the movie um, Angst, if you saw it, you might remember one of the things I think they talked about in the movie is holding two ice cubes. When someone is dealing with anxiety, holding two ice cubes that will calm someone down. Has anyone tried that? Anyone tried that? I actually have tried that. I tried it with my wife. It really worked. And she says, "Wow, that was the first." actually helpful thing you've ever done for me. I appreciate that, you know? Thank you so much. It actually worked. So holding two ice cubes, it sounds crazy, but when you're holding two ice cubes, your hands are just damn cold. You're not thinking about anything else. Um, so there are lots of things you can do um, to help a person who's suffering with anxiety or in that moment. But mostly, you want to be patient. You don't want them to think that they are a burden to you. You don't want them to think that, oh, in three minutes I'm going to be rushing out, um, that sort of thing. I'm just going to go through these. It's a good time. I always tell people, take out your phone if you want to take a, um, a picture of this. Here are just some things to keep in mind when you're dealing with an anxious child. <laughs> One is, don't pass along your anxiety. I'm, going to, I'm not asking. I'm going to raise my hand for a parent who passes along their anxiety. Jake, did you apply for that job? Jake, did you do this? Jake, did you do all of that sort of thing? So we don't want to pass along any of our anxiety. Um, and of course, we want to avoid avoidance means like, you know, we can't avoid anxiety. We really have to talk about it. And we need to learn how to say the right things and do the right things. Um, and being creative. You know, my daughter likes to write. If you have a child who likes to write or draw, that's a great way to deal with anxiety. And one of the things, we're not going to actually get to this one, one of the things that I like to do is to uh, deal with mindfulness. So we're going to do like a two minute mindfulness a uh, respite here, I'll call it, around anxiety, and then in a moment I'm going to hand it off to you, Jen. I haven't forgotten you. Okay, so we're going to deal with anxiety right here and right now. So I'm going to ask you guys to do a breathing exercise with me. Just be a couple minutes. There's no right or wrong way to do this. So begin by finding a comfortable place in your chair, whatever is comfortable for you. If you can, if you're comfortable, close your eyes. If you're really not comfortable, just pick a spot in the room. But if you're comfortable closing your eyes, it's great. Roll your shoulders slowly forward and then slowly back. Lean your head from side to side, lowering your left ear toward your left shoulder, and then your right ear toward your right shoulder. Relax your muscles. Your body will continue to relax as you do this. Observe your breathing. Notice how your breath flows in and out. Make no effort to change your breathing in any way. Simply notice how your body breathes. Your body knows how much air it is. <coughs> Sit quietly, seeing in your mind's eye your breath flowing gently in and out of your body. When your attention wanders, as it will, just focus back again on your breathing. Notice any stray thoughts, but don't dwell on them. Simply let them pass. See how your breath continues to flow deeply, calmly. Notice the stages of a complete breath, from the in-breath to the pause that follows to the exhale, and the pause before taking another breath. Feel the air entering your body and going down to your lungs. As thoughts intrude, allow them to pass and return your attention to your breathing. See the air inside your body after you inhale, filling your body gently. Notice how the space inside your lungs becomes smaller after you exhale and the air leaves your body. Feel your chest and stomach muscles gently rise and fall with each breath. Now as you inhale, silently count one. As you exhale, silently one. Inhale one. Exhale one. Notice how your body feels. See how calm and gentle your breathing is and how relaxed it is. Now it's time to reawaken your body and your mind. Keeping your eyes closed, notice the sounds around you in this room. Feel the floor beneath your feet, the clothes against your body. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. Straighten your legs, straighten your arms, open your eyes. What was that like for people? What was that like? Yeah, it's amazing. Like a simple breathing exercise um, is really um, very helpful. And it, it is exactly that. It's making sense. Ah, I don't want to do it. So um, 
The other thing I want to mention before I hand it off to Janet is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is a very effective therapy um, around anxiety. And I'll just tell you a, a second about it. A guy by the name of Aaron Beck is the founder of that. And basically, it talks about how we look at our irrational thoughts, and our irrational thoughts inform our feelings. So if we can change our irrational thoughts, remember, anxiety is all about irrational thoughts, then we can change our feelings. So it's not something you enter for like 20 years. It's not psycho. It's not some long psycho thing. It's brief. It's simple. If you have a young person at home or someone in your life who um, struggles with anxiety, just go on YouTube, find this video or another video, and you can learn about CBT very quickly. It is really an effective means. Making ah. So I'm going to hand it off to Jenna. Jenna is going to be sharing about her story. I've heard Jenna speak a zillion times, but I have to tell you, I, I listen like for the first time. She's got a lot of great things to say. After she speaks, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about um, self-harm, uh, depression, uh, and suicide. Sounds like it won't be depressing, but it won't be. You can switch. You want me to switch that? Okay. I learned to use computer to help you now. I've done an enlightening experience, let me tell you. As John said, I'm Jenna. I'm a young adult speaker for Minding Your Mind. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a professional public speaker. I'm, uh, by training, a chemist. Um, I got into the mental health field and into mental health advocacy because I lost a, somebody very close to me to suicide, and that really changed my entire outlook on how we talk about mental health. And because of that, I got involved with Minding Your Mind. So when I was young, when I was eight years old, I lost my father, um, not to suicide, I lost him to Lewy body dementia, which is similar to Alzheimer's. And I had no idea how to cope with this as an eight-year-old because I didn't really understand the concept of death. I didn't really understand um, why my dad wasn't home anymore and why I was not like normal families that had, you know, mom and dad and somebody staying home with me. So. My mom, thankfully, had taken my sister and I to counseling for many years to help us cope with uh, my dad's illness. And my sister during this was diagnosed with depression, and I was diagnosed with anxiety. My sister has always been um, much more uh, go with the flow than I have. My mom calls me stubborn, and I was a stubborn child, and I apparently am a stubborn adult. Um, when this doctor stopped giving me coloring books and Skittles and started giving me medication instead, I was not very happy with this change and I really wanted the Skittles and the M&Ms and the crayons back. So when she tries it, she's like, just swallow it. Just like you would swallow a Skittle or an M&M. I'm like, first off, I chew those. Secondly, no. And I spit it at her, um, which is probably why uh, she... Um, my mom claims that she requested that, that I requested that I stop seeing her. I think that the therapist requested that I never come back. Because, um, you know, I'm charming. <laughs> Spitting at her. So, throughout my young adult life, I developed this really unhealthy pattern of trying to cope with this anxiety because I was not receiving any form of treatment because I was an eight-year-old that didn't understand anxiety and didn't understand that I should have been swallowing those pills and not spitting them at people. So I actually pretty clearly remember my first panic attack, which is kind of rare. Um, I remember feeling like my heart was beating out of my chest, like somehow the blood in my body was going far too quickly, like I couldn't breathe and I was sobbing and I couldn't even catch my breath. And I was sitting on the stairs waiting for my mom to get home with my sister. And I was with a babysitter and I was convinced that because they were two minutes late that they had died. That was what my anxiety was telling me because I'd lost somebody else in my life. My anxiety was helping to rationalize an irrational thought. And I could not handle the idea of that. So instead, I convinced myself that it was because I didn't want my mom to get home because I didn't want to have to tell her about the A- minus that I'd gotten on a spelling test that day. And that was in the second grade, first off, so like, why would I care about it? grades? Like, that was pretty strange, first off. And secondly, an A- minus is super grave. For any of you out here that have ever been in school ever, you know that. Um, and I, I took this anxiety, I took all this, these feelings, and I refocused them on school. And I focused them on this idea of perfectionism, having to be this perfect person in school, 
and pleasing everybody else, making, you know, teacher's pet, doing all the extracurriculars and everything perfect, making everyone think I was this absolute A-plus, fantastic person. Whereas internally, I never felt that way. I was always this very anxious person. I always felt like I had to do more, like my heart was beating on my chest, and there was no reason for it. But I couldn't rationalize that. And this lasted all throughout elementary school, middle school, and high school, where I just wanted to make myself look perfect, the word that I should not be using, for every single person in my life except for myself. I just wanted to outwardly be this incredible person for other people to see, but I didn't see it ever in myself. And by the time it uh, came to high school and I had to apply to colleges, I didn't think I would get into any of them because I never saw myself as a worthy person. So I applied to a ton of different schools, and when the day came around, um, I ended up getting into every single one of those schools. And instead of being elated like I should have been, this just caused me to have another panic attack because now I had to choose one of these schools to go to and I didn't think I could make the perfect decision that please every single person in my life and I didn't think I was worthy of any of these acceptance letters. And I spent the entire day crying in my guidance counselor's office and crying in my classes and having my friends follow me to the bathroom and crying more in my guidance counselor's office, which I'm sure she loved because she'd actually just returned from maternity leave. And she told me, I remember this day, that I cried more than her newborn. I had never been so flattered. Um, she regretted, and I still regrets to this day, we keep in touch, uh, giving me her cell phone number. Um, because eventually I had to leave the building and I still had not picked a school. And I didn't know how I was going to make this choice because I've never had to do something like this that I knew wasn't going to please everyone. My sister wanted me to go to school near her. My friends wanted me to go to school near them. My mom wanted me to go to her alma mater. And I wanted to go hide in my room and never leave. I was panicking. I was crying. And I had no idea how I was going to make this decision. So finally, it's 9 o'clock, and my best friend Kennedy calls me and says, where are you going to college? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, I spent half my day with you in the bathroom. I'm tired. I want to frost the cupcakes in your color of choice for your college. Because I had made her cupcakes in the color of choice for her college. And she was like, I want to go to bed. Please just pick a school. And I was like, well, I don't know. She's like, pick one out of the freaking hat. So that's what I did. <laughs> That's actually where how I ended up choosing my school. I wish I was making that up. Really not. I would say I don't recommend it, but honestly, I'm not sure I regret it. Um, in retrospect. So I ended up at my school, and I hated it. I'll get I'll get to me not hating it. I promise. Um, but I was sitting in my dorm room and. I was doing work all the time, and I was sitting in the library, and I was doing work all the time, and I was still in my old habits of, I wanted to be, you know, now professor's pet, not teacher's pet. I wanted to just be this perfect person, and I didn't really know how to have these new interactions with my roommate, and I wasn't super interested in having these interactions with my roommate, and I didn't want to go to parties like other people were going to, because to me that just wasn't... I wasn't able to. I felt very anxious whenever I tried to have these conversations with my roommate, and whenever I, I would even get ready to leave for a party, and I would say, oh, you know what, just, uh, I'll meet you there, I just have to go to the bathroom, and wouldn't go. I couldn't do it. Um, and that, I realized I wasn't alone in, because I was talking to my friend Kennedy, we would, we were texting all the time, even though we were at different colleges, and FaceTiming and all that because it got really boring eventually doing my homework alone in the library every night. <laughs> I know, so cool, so fun. Um, and she one night was studying for a psychology exam while I was um, pretending to study for whatever class I was taking at the time. And she read out loud two different definitions and they were generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. And these definitions really stuck with us because both of us had felt the same way I just explained, that we didn't really want to go out, 
we were just upset all the time. We didn't really feel like doing anything but our work, and then that was it. We were too exhausted to do anything else or too anxious to do anything else. And what really struck us about these definitions was that they can interfere with normal activities. And for us, we felt like they were because we were seeing all of these other people around us going to these parties, posting the pictures on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all the other social media that we use nowadays. And we weren't doing that. We were in the library until 2 in the morning just like Skyping each other. So finally we both agreed that we would make counseling appointments at our school um, and we would go and we would actually try and see if there was something that was wrong, if there was a chemical imbalance in our brain, and if there was actually a disorder and we could actually get help. And I think one of the most relieving days for me was about a month and a half after both of us started counseling, within a week of each other, we were both diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. And Kennedy and I, that's me and Kennedy at our high school graduation, um, were scared but relieved because we'd never had this diagnosis before. I knew I had been diagnosed with anxiety when I was younger, but I had never actually been in a position where I felt comfortable enough to do something about it, and that was because I had Kennedy. That was because I had this person that I could talk to who was going through the exact same thing as me, who I felt comfortable expressing everything I was going to, through with, and she felt comfortable doing the exact same thing, which was great. And Throughout that entire rest of our semester, for our first year of college, we were talking every day and we were finally getting a proper treatment. We both found therapists, which did take a while and can take a while, but it, we ended up finding people we liked. Um, we both started medication regimes, which don't work for everyone, but worked very well for us. And by the time we finished our first year of school, I was so excited because I wasn't this people pleaser anymore, I, and I was still doing fine in my classes, but I wasn't doing perfectly, and I was so excited to see that like my grades were in all A's, like I was excited about you know the minus and the B and all that kind of stuff, because to me I was like, yeah, I got to be in organic chemistry because I went to that couple parties and you know drink a lot of water because hydration is super important. <laughs> um, and it was... It was an amazing feeling knowing that not only had I managed to finish my first year of college without transferring like I thought I was going to those first couple weeks, but I had managed to finish my first year of college while taking control of my own life, my own mental health, and doing it alongside my best friend. That was incredibly important to me. So we went home for the summer, and it was great. We were excited because we could you know, swap stories with all our friends from home. We both went to school out of state, so it was nice to be able to go back and see everyone that we hadn't seen for a while, uh, you know, swap all the crazy pictures, or crazy for me was like probably just like holding a solo cup, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and it came time for the first of the people in my friend group from home to go back to school. And of course, uh, she had to send her stuff to Colorado and hadn't started packing yet. So a couple of us went over early to start helping her pack. And on my way to her house, I got a notification on my phone, because I lived in a pretty small town, saying that there was an accident and to avoid a certain area. And I didn't think much of it. I went to my friend's house, um, was helping her pack throughout the day. Uh, two of my friends were EMTs, and they, I, they told me that they had been told not to respond to the call, even though they were actually on call that day. Um, but I still didn't think anything of it. And then finally later, we were driving to Dunkin' Donuts, and um, they turned around and told me that they thought they knew why they were told not to respond to the accident earlier in the day. And I was kind of confused as to why they were like, still kind of talking about this and mentioning this and didn't really understand what the relevance of it was. And they wouldn't tell me any more than that. They just kept saying, like, we think uh, we know what might have happened in the accident. And finally, I started prying information out of that, and I said, well, did somebody pass away? And they said, yes. And I asked if I had met this person before, and they said, yes. And I asked more and more questions, and they wouldn't give me a name because they said, we don't know if it's true, we haven't gotten any confirmation, we don't want to tell you. So I took out my phone, and 
I looked up global accident. And I read the most horrifying words you can read in an article, which were uh, my best friend's name followed by the words died by suicide. I found out that in that accident that very morning that I had been ignoring the entire day because I didn't think it related to my life had just changed my entire life. My best friend Kennedy had just died by suicide hours earlier, and I hadn't known it until that very minute. And in my head sometimes, I can still hear myself screaming, because in my head, it's been almost four and a half years, and it's still sometimes, like, I can just pretend she's at her, her job, and that, like, we're still in the same place sort of thing, even though I, I'm a rational person, I know she's passed away. But this feeling in that very moment of knowing that I just lost the person that had helped me survive so much of my life up until that point, and now she wasn't with me anymore because of the thing that we were dealing with together because of our anxiety and depression, it hurt, and it hurt like a lot. And when I went back to school, I don't remember the first three weeks of going back. I remember waking up one day and realizing that if I just continued that cycle of just waking up, doing the bare minimum of what I needed to to survive, I wasn't going to. And that's when I found Samaritans, which is a group in Massachusetts that um, has a lot of grief support services, and one of them is called Safe Place, which is a group for people that have lost loved ones, specifically to suicide. And I kind of just very blindly went to this group because I didn't know what I was getting myself into here. It was in downtown Boston, the meeting that I was going to, and I was a sophomore in college. It was my first, it was kind of one of my first times venturing into the downtown area with like by myself and it was at night and I was terrified. And I walk into this room and I'm, I feel like I'm about to be judged. And instead I'm greeted by all these people who are so welcoming of not just me, but of my story and of my anxiety and my depression and of Kennedy's story. And listening to all of them is what helped me be able to get through a lot of my sophomore year. Because listening to their stories and realizing that a couple that had lost their only child, a woman that had lost her sister, a girl that had lost her father, could get out of bed every day and still be very successful people made me realize that I could too. I just needed to give myself time and I needed to help myself get better treatment. And that was a mind-blowing experience for me because I didn't realize that I would actually be able to get past this and be able to smile again. I do remember the first time that I did laugh afterward though was um, I was walking past a cupcake place and went in. And I got two. I got my favorite flavor and her favorite flavor. And that was what I ate for dinner that day because my diet is very important to me. <laughs> and I, I remember eating them like, in the cupcake place laughing to myself, like maniacally laughing, because I knew if like I knew like her like listening and watching me do this, like my friend, she would just be mocking me, being like, This is your excuse now for eating two cupcakes for dinner? Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alright. Um, because she had the very same sense of humor as I did. We were both very uh, sarcastic people. As you might have noticed. Um, <laughs> And it helped me start to not get over it, but to find myself again. To feel like I was actually coming back to myself in a different perspective and in a different way. Because now I, I had this like new, I felt like I had this new sense of purpose. And I didn't really know what it was at the time. Um, until I met um, my friend Jackie who actually um, would have been Kennedy's roommate her sophomore year of college. So we both became very close to each other because um, we were essentially in the same exact situation. We were both best friends with Kennedy, had no idea what had happened, like why anything had happened, and we bonded very, very quickly. And we both knew that we wanted to do something to help honor Kennedy's memory and we had no idea what we wanted to do um, until one day I got a text message from one of my friends saying, I woke up today and I completely forgot how amazing I am. Which is kind of like a funny text message to get and I was like, 
girl, you're lovely, you're awesome, you're seriously amazing. Like, what are you missing here? And it totally struck me in that moment that everybody deserves to wake up and feel amazing. So Jackie and I decided to honor Kennedy's birthday by printing t-shirts with the word amazing written backwards on them. So that when you look in the mirror, you can physically see it for yourself. And you can actually see that you are this incredible person that deserves to be here. Because there's always going to be, our, our motto is there's always somebody who can't see your worth and don't let it be you. Um, and we thought we'd sell like 11 of these because that's how many we needed to sell to be able to print them for super cheap. Um, we thought like we'd reach for friends and family. We sell 11. We all wear them on the birthday. We feel connected. It would be a very nice healing experience for us. Instead, over a period of about 24, 48 hours, we sold over 400 shirts to people as far as Australia. And I don't, I, like, I've never been there. I don't know anyone in Australia. Like, I'm not going there. There's spiders that can eat me there. <laughs> um, and, like, that was mind-blowing to me, that this idea, this simple idea of just writing amazing backwards on a shirt and saying it was because we had lost our best friend to suicide and we wanted other people to know that they were amazing and to be able to start a conversation about themselves and about mental health by wearing this shirt connected with people not only in the United States but all over Europe in Australia and it was mind like it was absolutely mind boggling and when we ended the campaign because we had just planned on having it be like literally this two day thing so we could have the shirt printed by her birthday we got so many messages on Facebook and on emails asking where they could buy the shirts. And they weren't just people that we knew, they were people from across like the oceans. Like, it was, it's still to this day, and we started this almost two years ago, it is mind blowing to me that this message connected with so many people. And actually, I was doing some spring cleaning um, last marathon, on Marathon Monday, and I found, um, the shirt that I wore to last year's um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention hosts an Out of the Darkness walk every year. Um, and I had gotten white shirts for everyone on my team to wear. And I had posted on my Facebook that I didn't want to just walk for myself. I wanted to walk for everyone that had lost, that everyone that I had known or that other people had known that had lost their lives to suicide. Every name on this shirt is somebody who has been lost to suicide. <coughs> and there's over 50 names on the shirt. And this was just like, I posted something I posted randomly two days before the event. And I saved the shirt because it means an incredible amount to me that this many people opened up to me because I started opening up about my own mental health challenges. I started opening up about my own anxiety and depression instead of lying about it. During this time, before we started the campaign, I actually took a semester off of college because of everything that I had dealt with, because of my friend um, passing away, because I had also lost both my grandparents in that time, because I was sexually assaulted during, this, during that period as well. It was a nice lemony snicket series of events. And um, I had lied about it when I got back to school. I had said I got this fantastic internship that I like had to leave school for. And then when I came back, I felt like I felt like an idiot, honestly, for saying that because I was like, why can't, why can I walk around like with my knee, wearing shorts with my knees bruised up, and people would be like, oh my gosh, what did you do? But I can't walk around and tell people like I had to take a semester off because I was having too bad of anxiety, like because all these things happened in my life. And the amazing campaign really helped me to learn that I was not alone in wanting to share my experience. I was just one of the first people to actually find a way that made me comfortable in doing it and made other people comfortable in doing it as well. Um, to this day, like we still get a ton of messages and a ton of um, comments about the campaign. One of my favorites actually was I went to, uh, during the blizzard, I went to a doctor appointment with my boyfriend and I was like half asleep wearing my amazing campaign hat and the doctor just kept staring at me and he left the room and I was like, this is very weird. Your doctor keeps staring at me. Like, that's creepy. And I was like, yeah, I know. And then finally the doctor comes back and is like, 
okay, what what is your hat? Why is it backwards? And he's just very this very aggressive, very loud guy. And I'm like, I immediately woke me up, that's for sure. Um, and I'm like, it's a, it's a mental health thing. Uh, it's a mental health prevention. He's like, explain. So I did. I told him what I just, I, the shorter version of what I just told you. And he's like, I want it. And so I, I give him the website and he immediately, like, I get a notification on my phone that he ordered a hat. And he goes, and he's looking around his office and he had a, a poster with a mirror lax on it and a scale of reading your diarrhea. And um, he's like, I don't like this. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. And he's like, I want one about mental health. I want one about suicide and suicide prevention. And he's an allergist, not a mental health doctor. Uh, I don't know why he's in your life supposed to be fully honest. Um, but the fact that an allergist then wanted this poster, I was like, that's pretty cool that like my hat and now this guy being like, I want a poster about suicide prevention so that if somebody comes in here, if I leave them sitting here alone with their parents and maybe they've been struggling, they can talk about it. He even told me about how he lost people in his own life to suicide just because he read my hat while I was half asleep. And after that, I posted it on um, the campaign's Facebook, um, the story about it and the picture of the poster. And we ended up sending a bunch of posters to different doctors that were like, why are we not doing that? Why are we advertising all these different drug products that we don't intend, that we have no intention of really marketing, for example, Miralax, and not pushing a conversation about something that is actually life-threatening, that is actually hurting us? And the amazing campaign is what helped me finish my college career, like 100%, because it helped me to be honest, and I needed that in my life at that time. And when I finished college, I was happy with myself because I, I did my best. Like, I, that's what the pin says. Uh, which I was like, and I wore that during graduation, they were like, that's against policy. And I was like, so am I, probably, so whatever. Um, and I was just like happy that I had done it. And then finally I was like, so elated that I decided to go to grad school, which was a mistake. Um, for the most part. And... I ended up kind of resorting back into old habits of wanting to please my professor that I'd never met before, uh, wanting him to just think that all my research was free and that I was working really hard. And it was to the point where I was like almost sleeping in the lab some days. And I went to my therapist and she's like, this is not a good look for you. Like, you kind of smell like clearly you haven't showered in a couple days. I don't know what's happening with your face right now. <laughs> Like, I mean, it's true, I don't know what was happening in my face either. I was scared, probably like in my hair at that point. And she was like, you're not gonna make it through the program if you keep doing this to yourself. And I was like, well, I'm already seeing you, a great therapist. She's like, thank you. Um, and I was like, and I'm already on a pretty good medication regime and I'm still going to Samaritan's. And she's like, uh, I was like, what else can I do? And she's like, have you ever heard of an emotional support animal? And I was like, no. What is it? And she looked at me like I was two and was like, it's an animal that emotionally supports you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, a grown up reason to get a puppy. So, um, my indecision from when I was in uh, high school and trying to pick a college had totally gone out the window at this point. And within like 12 hours, I had applied to get a dog, and I sent the link to my boyfriend. I was like, just so you know, because he lived with me, I was like, they'll be calling you um, to make sure that you're okay with them, the dog situation. He's like, yeah, I didn't think this would happen that fast. Uh, did you forget that I'm allergic to dogs? That's why he's an allergist, in case I'm wondering. So um, we got the dog, and two weeks later, we picked him up. Uh, this is Otis. We got him about a year and a half ago. And he literally saved my life. And some people will say that emotional support animals aren't real. Well, I'm sure that you've heard many stories on the news about peacocks and stuff, and like people bringing spiders on airplanes and tarantulas and whatever. Um, I can 100% say that emotional support animals, at least for me, are incredibly real. This dog gave me a reason to get out of bed every single day. This dog gave me a reason to leave my lab every single day. Gave me a reason to be happy every single day. And like, even when I didn't want to do certain things, when I didn't want to like smile or laugh or leave my room, 
he made me. Like, this, uh, this animal is just as crazy as I am. And I know this because when I took him to the vet for the first time, such a bonding experience. <laughs> the vet does a full exam and goes, just so you know, your dog has anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I have never been more in love in my life. <laughs> and she's like, uh, okay, like it's fine, like he's perfectly healthy otherwise. And I was like, I know, I'm just so excited. <laughs> like it's just so perfect. <laughs> and what I learned from getting this dog and from all the experiences in my life was, well, first off, a lot of things. First off, that dogs, everyone should probably want an animal. Uh, that's just my humble opinion. But I learned that you deserve to live the life you've been given. But what if we adopted him from this really high kill shelter? And that, like, the part of the reason that I wanted to get like shelter dog, even though I had no idea what I was getting myself into, was because I fully believe that like every single person and Otis deserves to live the life that we've been given. Like we've been given it for a reason. And taking steps to improve your mental health looks different for everybody. My sister still has depression, and she actually does have anxiety as well. And I would never suggest that she get an animal because her apartment, like, they would eat everything on the floor. She's just not that clean. Um, and lastly, there will always be somebody that wants to help you, even if you don't see it. Because it took me, after Kennedy passed away, a very long time to see that there were people in my life that still wanted to help me, even if they weren't Kennedy. And all I had to do was actually start talking and just saying the simplest things about how I was feeling. And there were people that would be there for me. And even if you're not comfortable talking to someone in your life necessarily, there's always the crisis text hotline. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And there's a million other resources out there and people that are willing to help you. So thank you very much for letting me share my story. many times and I'm just always so moved by that. Thank you so much. So I just want to start, we're going to flip around a little bit because usually when I speak and Jenna speak, we all don't talk for a long period of time, but um, we're going to condense it. So I wanted to show you the youth misbehavior survey. Virtually every town in Massachusetts does this. And it's a survey of students. This is actually from Wilmington High School, not all that far from here. And this looks at uh, all sorts of mental health issues and risk-taking behavior issues. The numbers in parentheses are so the factored out numbers. I thought we'd just start here, and we're going to obviously focus on suicide in the beginning. Let's start with middle school. So we had 51 middle school, middle school students in Wilmington um, who had a suicide plan, 81 students who seriously thought about suicide, and 21 middle school students who actually attempted to end their life. For 24 years, I was a director of Native Youth Services. If you've been in this area for a while, you might remember about 12 years ago, we had a lot of completed suicides. And Nita started out with it very directly from a community point of view. And let's look at some of the high school numbers. Interestingly enough, when we look at the discrepancy um, for self-injury, self-injury is burning, cutting, ingesting. Why would someone self-injure? Well, someone who's self-injured does it for a reason and a good reason for them. It's actually not a very sustainable model, but it makes sense to them. People who self-injure actually feel a measure of optimism, a measure of control, and after they self-injure, they report they feel better. However, it's really not the best way um, to deal with things. The differential between male and female, I'm not a biologist, so I can't speak to that, but I do know in our culture, us guys, we have to be stoic. We don't have anxiety, we don't have depression. So you can see on these two, self-injury and sad and hopeless, there were for depression, the big discrepancy between male and female. I don't think it actually exists to that level. But let's look at the number of students who have seriously considered suicide. 157 students, I'm gonna pick up on something you said earlier. Let's pretend that instead of that, I said at North Reading High School we had 157 students who had diarrhea. Yes, I did say diarrhea, so did you. We're talking about diarrhea tonight. What did the health department do? They closed down the building, they scrub it from top to bottom. Can you imagine? You'll be retired in Arizona or Florida in like 20 or 30 years, and you'll say, oh yes, I, I lived in North Reading, and they'll say, oh, is that the diarrhea place? Like, it would be unforgettable. Channel 5 would have that. Can you imagine? Diarrhea in North Reading. People would be driving around the town. They don't want to get it. Well, diarrhea is not a lot of fun. It's not going to end your life. Look at that. 157 students 
And look at the number of students who made a suicide plan. And again, these are from Wilmington High School. Um, 90 students who actually attempted to end their life. We've been really fortunate that we haven't had more completed suicides. And let's talk about proper terms. You don't want to say successful suicide. You want to say completed suicide. And we don't even say committed suicide anymore. That's like committed a crime, committed a felony. You heard Jenna talk about died by suicide. Massachusetts has actually one of the lowest completion rates for suicide in the country. And by that I mean when we look at suicide attempts versus completed suicides, we're happy to be low. Anybody have a guess about why Massachusetts would have such a low completion rate? It's really simple, actually. It's gun control. Think about this. If you're going to try to use a gun to end your life, you're going to have a high completion rate. States like Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, where gun control laws are more lax, have incredibly high rates of completed suicide. We have more stringent and strict gun control laws, so we have lower rates, and we're really happy about that. But look at this. 90 students in one school. We have been really fortunate um, around suicide. Um, and of course, we all have to learn so much about suicide. I want to tell a story about a guy by the name of Kevin Hines. And Kevin was like a lot of people who were suicidal. He thought that he was a burden to other people. He thought the world would be better without him. If he took his life, things would be better for his parents, for his friends, for his family. And he was going to that one specific place in this country where the most number of suicide attempts and completed suicides have happened. Anybody have a guess where that is? The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the scene of thousands of suicide attempts built in 1937. Thousands of people have died there. In fact, if you've ever been there, you know there's all sorts of signage there. There are all sorts of barriers up there because they knew that the people jump off. And Kevin was on a public bus, and he's weeping openly, saying, please, if someone will ask me, am I all right? I won't do it. Because one of the mantras about suicide is, it's not that people want to die. It's that they can't figure out a way to go on living. He couldn't figure out a way to go on living. He thought he had shamed himself, shamed his family, shamed everything that he touched was going badly. Things were going to be better if he took his life. And he's hoping someone will ask him if he's all right. Nobody said a word to him on that bus. And as luck would have it, he had to transfer and get on another bus, weeping openly, saying, please, somebody, I'm all right. I don't want to do this. Nobody said a word. It's hard to know what to say. The bus comes to a halt, and he says, somebody is looming over him. Thank God somebody is going to save me. It was the bus driver. And the bus driver said this. It's the end of the line, you've got to get off. They were at the base of the Golden Gate Bridge. Nobody cares, nobody notices. The world will be better without me. And he starts walking up on that bridge. And as luck would have it, there was a tourist with a camera. And shoved the camera in his face and said, will you take my picture? He did. The tourist never asked how he was. Nobody cares, nobody notices. I am going to do it. Walks up on that bridge and jumps off of that bridge. It takes four seconds by the time you jump off that bridge till you hit the water. One, two, three, four. It's actually a decent amount of time. And on the way down, he's thinking, I wish I hadn't done it. He hits the water, he goes down 80 feet. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm five feet under in a pool, I'm freaking out. He's 80 feet under. He is a broken man. His bones, a hundred broken bones, his eardrums are burst. His first thought is, am I alive? His second thought is, thank God I'm alive. How strange is that for someone, for all intents and purposes, was not going to live. And now he is desperate to live. Desperate to figure out which way is up, which way is down. Desperate to get to the surface. And somehow he claws his way to the surface and he pops out of the water and he's exuberant. But now he's got a problem. He's in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Did anyone see him jump? He can't swim. He knows he has a lot of injuries. What's he going to do? And he's in the water for just a second, and he feels this. What's that? And again, again. And now he knows exactly what is happening. How strange is this? He has jumped off that bridge, somehow he survived, and he's going to get eaten by a shark. Like, how crazy is that? So come on, you guys have seen Shark Week. What do you do if a shark attacks you? Somebody help me out. Punch him in the nose, thank you. I was doing a teacher training in Sandwich on the cake. 140 teachers, nobody knew. I said, for God's sake, it's the cake. It's a protective factor. You're swimming in the water. you got to know this stuff. And he is flailing at this creature, trying to keep himself alive, desperate to live. How strange for someone who all intents and purposes was going to die. 
And there's a boat that comes out, that actually comes out to pick up dead bodies, because almost nobody survives. Of the thousands who jumped off, only about 25 have survived. And they have body bags, and they're ready to use it. They almost never see someone alive in the water. They get out there as fast as they can, but not fast enough for him, because he is getting attacked. And again, and again, and again, and he's flailing to keep himself alive, desperate to keep himself alive. And the boat finally gets there, and they take him, and they pull him up on the boat, and they say to him, do you know what happened? But he really can't hear very well. His eardrums are burst, and he starts <coughs> screaming. Do you know what happened? And he says, yes, I jumped off the bridge. No, 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 do you know what happened? Yes, I jumped off the bridge. No, do you know what happened in the water? Yes, I was going to get eaten by a shark. That was crazy. I said, that was no shark. He said, oh, believe me, I was in the water. That was a shark. I said, that was no shark. We saw the whole thing. We couldn't believe what we saw. Here's what happened. You could not keep yourself afloat. You were going below the surface. And when you did, there was a sea lion that hit you in the back, pushed you to the surface, kept you afloat, kept you alive. Well, the takeaway is really obvious. We all, going to myself, we, we all need to do a better job about the people around us who are in pain, who are thinking about suicide, and how we can help them. So I want to tell you a story about my dad. My dad is 93 years old. Um, well, let's, let's, let's do a little quiz here. You guys look like a smart crowd here. OK, let's do this. I'm going to change a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm all over. The reason why I'm, I'm all over with slides is because we are a little bit all over. Okay. So, just call out. You don't even have to raise your hand. The age for boys and men in Massachusetts. We'll start with two years ago. The most number of completed suicides. You don't even have to raise your hand. Just call it out now. The age, no range for boys and men. Most number of suicides completed. Go. Call it out. 54. Other? other? 35. 21. Boys and men. 
let's talk about suicide. We're in the middle of baseball season. How come the Red Sox are suddenly coming back? They're teasing us. They're killing us this year. Okay. Raise your hand if you've been to Fenway Park. If you haven't been there, you should get there. I think they're going to be okay. All right. Imagine you're in Fenway Park and imagine looking to your left and looking to your right, looking in the dugout, looking at everyone in that stadium. That's the number of people that die by suicide, plus 7,000 more. 44,000 people die by suicide. Let's go back to the E. coli example. Less than 100? 44,000. When was the last time the CDC was on the front page of every newspaper, of every social media outlet, saying we really have to think about suicide? Of the top 10 reasons why people die in this country, you know them. <laughs> they're on the list. They're decreasing. Suicide is now number 10. It is increasing in many states, like Nevada, it is now number 8. And it will be increasing. So it's things we have to know about. We have to know how to respond. We have to know about the myths and the facts about suicide. So for example, I'm always pleased this time of year because the holidays are the worst times around suicide. Actually not. The holidays are actually a safer time. The most dangerous time, statistically speaking, around suicide is right now in the springtime. People don't realize that. Why? There are a lot of different theories around that. One is that you're really depressed in the winter. In the spring, you feel a little bit better, but you're still depressed. But your sense is everyone else is happy. And that gap is really hard. Another thing that people are starting to really think about is the fact that our immune system, think about the immune system that we all have this time of year is really compromised with all the pollen and that sort of thing. Our immune system keeps us alive in a lot of different ways we um, don't know about. So we have to learn the myths and the facts. And we have to make it easy for people to ask for help. When I was running the town of Needles Youth Services, there was a young man who was suicidal. And he was in my office. Clearly, he was suicidal. And I said to him, look, we've got to call your parents. We have to have Riverside in and get you evaluated. He jumps up, and he runs out of my office. I've never done this, but I jump up, and I start chasing him. So if you know downtown Needham, I start chasing around the comet. It must have been the weirdest sight. I'm chasing this kid. And somehow, miraculously, I catch up to him. I have my arm around him, and I'm walking back to my office in the basement of Town Hall. Every human service department, I believe, has to be in the basement. Uh, I don't know where you are, Martin. Think you did something higher than a basement? Yes. All right, good for you. And I'm walking back, and I'm saying the things you can imagine about he's important and keeping him safe, and all the things you can imagine. So physically spent was I, so emotionally spent. And you know in your job, after you've had a tough day, you have to debrief with someone that you care about, someone who knows what you do. And I did just that. I called my friend Nancy. And I said, Nancy, I just need to talk this through with you. I need some support. And I start telling her this story, because I'm really, really hurting. And she starts laughing. And I said, wow, that's really not what I was expecting. Like, what are you talking about? She says, I just think it's funny. And she says, what? I said, what's so funny? I said, I'm about to hang up the damn phone. She says, before you hang up, let me tell you what, what's funny. And I said, what? She says, well, I've known you since college. You're a really good athlete, John, but you're really slow. Is that true? You've told me it's a 10th grade boy on the soccer team at Needham High School who played wing. And then I knew there was no way I could catch that kid. He wanted to get caught. People want help. They often don't know how to ask for help. Think about this. You break your leg, you're going to wait three days, three weeks, three months, three years to get that set. That's ludicrous. But that's what we do around the anxiety and depression and that sort of thing. Okay, we'll do another quiz here. All right. Who would you say has a higher rate of suicidal ideation, thoughts of suicide, suicide attempts, um, and completed suicide? 18 to 22 year olds who are working. They're going gap year. They're working. They're not going to college. 18 to 22 year olds who are matriculating in college or actually in college at the time. Raise your hand if you think the college students would have higher rate. Well, of course, they've got a lot more stress. Actually, it's the complete opposite. Sorry to trick you like that. And I want to tell you why. Remember that goofy exercise I had when you paired up? Having eyes on someone else is the most protective factor we know. When you're in college, you have a roommate who has eyes on you, an RA who has eyes on you, someone in your study group who has eyes on you. We have to have eyes on the people in our lives. And we have to be comfortable saying things like, you don't seem happy, or what's going on with you, or that sort of thing. All right, we're going to flip way around here. Um, yeah, so here, here are the stats, um, some college statistics. 
they're higher in college than they are in high school. And you see the number one reason why students go for counseling in college is around anxiety. It's something that's um, pretty hidden, but is suddenly being talked about. And here's some of the warning signs. None of this will really surprise you. And I want to talk a little bit about um, technology. Raise your hand if you know someone who looks better and happier on their social media than they do in real life. Yeah, I had this experience with my wife in the last year. We're in bed, you know, God forbid my wife and I would talk, read a book, fool around, we're on our phones, right, you know? And, you know, we're checking the sports scores, People Magazine, all that stuff, we're all in our, we're doing a lot of parallel play. And my wife says to me out of the blue, how can we never bite through Nicaragua? I said, what? I said, how can we never bite through Nicaragua? I said, what are you talking about? And she says, look, and I had to grab the phone. No one likes to give up their phone. And I said, who is this? She says, you haven't met her, but this is my friend. She's biking through Nicaragua. I said, how about the Lexi to bike pad? Let's close to our house. Can we start locally? And I said, wait a second. Isn't this your friend who hates her husband? She says, yeah, that's him. Isn't that her husband? Yeah, that's him. They look so damn happy. Think about this. Young people in particular are living their lives in real time. Right? But they're watching everyone else's life in a very filtered way. Mm -hmm. It's hard for adults to see that. You can imagine for young people um, what it's like. I love technology. And the first studies of Facebook and all the social media came out said this is a great way to connect. The second studies came out and says, oh, people are feeling really crappy when they're online. The last studies that came out said, not surprisingly, when you're posting, you feel good. When you're surfing, you feel not so good. But guess what? We surf about 98% of the time. I want to play this video about a young person who did what every young person should do, and that's make a mistake. But it really illustrates how technology can really play a harmful role. And there is no sound for this.
That's a sad story of Amanda Todd. By the way, that video is on YouTube if you're interested in viewing it again or maybe seeing it with your child. Um, that's a sad story of Amanda Todd. We did what every 12 year old should do, and that's make a mistake. Technology is not very generous, it's not very forgiving. That ended up to be a completed suicide, and you can see the interplay between making a mistake, anxiety, technology, depression, and eventually completed suicide. I love technology, as I said, but I have to say, technology and the adolescent brain is really not a good match. And guess what? It's not just adolescents. Anthony Weiner, remember that guy? He didn't know how to use technology either. So it's not just young people. The name Kyla Clemente might ring a bell for some of you. Kyla Clemente was a freshman at Rutgers University who decided to have consensual sex with another man, another student. His roommate filmed it and live streamed that to the dorm. Anybody know what happened to Kyla Clemente? Yep, access point. Bridges are access points, just as guns are access points. I didn't know him, but I read a lot about him. But I can tell you this, it's not that he wanted to die. He just couldn't figure out a way to go on living given the shame that he felt, unfortunately, about that sort of thing. So around technology, I always say to parents, has to sleep in your room. I do a whole talk on technology. I hate doing it. It's such a downer. My parents ask me, what's the best tip you have? And I'll just give it to you very quickly. Sunday night, charge up your child's cell phone, their Chromebook, whatever they have, and say, guess what? That's it for the week. And when it runs out, you're done. I have to tell you, you have to monitor, because if leaves your house at 72% and comes back at 85%, they've been cheating, and they automatically lose it. I can tell you what will happen the first week, because I have a lot of emails about it from parents saying, it was awful. By Wednesday, my child ran out of juice. It's my fault they're doing poorly in school. Guess what? By the next week, they're watching fewer videos, takes up less juice, and it's going until Thursday or Friday, that sort of thing. So around technology, we really have to have conversations. Um, this is an acronym to help you remember around suicide. Um, you can see people who are anxious on there, people who are hopeless, we know that people are helpless, um, that sort of thing. We all, and I'm pointing to myself too, we all need to do a better job when we're here the 10th leading cause of death in this country. Wow. We all need to do a better job. So, here are some resources that you know about. You also know the resource of Mind Your Mind. So Jen and I and other young adult speakers, we are in schools, we do lots of talks, we love doing this. I hope that you saw um, in myself and Jen that we really love doing it, we think it's really important. Um, we're going to take the last, oh, that's, that's not something to use. Um, we're going to have Jenna come up, we're going to take questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. I can see, is it hot in the room or am I having, okay, good. I thought I was getting sick then. All right, so we're going to take some questions and then um, we'll hang out if you want to talk to us more privately. So, does anyone have a question they would like to ask on this hot evening? It always seems cold outside. <laughs> I could be, could be menopause. Any question that anyone has? to the side, I just want to... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Any questions that anyone has? Okay, that's fine. It's late. It's, it's, it seems oh, like it's in the middle. How did you get so brief? I stopped caring what other people thought, to be quite honest. I think, um, especially in Samaritans, um, which is one of the resources that John had up there before, um, I learned that in making myself vulnerable and in making, uh, sharing my story, um, it wasn't a weakness like I thought it was. Uh, talking about my own mental health and talking about losing my best friend wasn't a weakness like I thought. And I wasn't judged. Um, and I think that was a huge part of how I became able to share my story and start talking about it and hopefully help me other people. And they do it. When Jenna speaks, and our young adult, young adult speakers speak, this is true. Students line up to thank her to say, I'm going to talk to my guidance counselor. It is very moving. It is very empowering for students to have, a, you know, gain the courage after listening to Jenna's story. Other questions that anyone may have? Yes? I've been a teacher for about 20 years, and it's, you definitely see it more anxiety in small children and young yep. um, adults. Yep. Why do we see it, physically see it so much more? So there's a lot. There's actually been a lot of good research ar around that. First of all, that we're understanding that sleep plays a big role, and we also know that technology plays a role. So think about it. If you're on technology, you're getting less sleep. 
So that plays a big role. Um, technology is something that can get us anxious. I'm going to raise my hand. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten anxious when your technology breaks down. Yeah, we all do, right? Think about this. I'll tell you a true story. So my son turned 26 uh, last year. And my wife put on her Facebook page a picture of Jake at 26 and a picture of Jake at like when he was like six months old, a year old. We're in bed, my wife and I are talking, and she says to me, I gotta check my Facebook. And I said, watch this, I have to see how many likes I have. I said, you're 58 years old, get over it. <laughs> think about what it's like for a young person. So I think we are seeing an increase for a lot of reasons, but primarily we're also diagnosing it. We used to think kids were just being rude, they were being obstinate. They weren't listening to us. Now we know that anxiety is really a part of that, and we know that teachers can play such a key role in keeping people anxious. I was speaking at a high school in Cambridge talking about anxiety in the cafeteria, and the principal said, well, I feel really crappy because when I see kids who are not in the cafeteria during lunchtime, I'm just shoving them in there. Now I'm starting to realize those kids might be anxious. So having conversations about it, this whole presentation is all about stigma, and having the courage to do it, um, to talk about things, we don't have a problem talking about a broken leg, but we do have a problem talking about anxiety and other things. Other questions people have? Yes? I have a question. So the links that you just put up, would you say that those would be good places to start, like the NAMI and all of that, if you were trying to find some sort of therapist? Yeah, OK. So let's talk about that. Um, huh. All right, I'm a therapist, I will a lot tell of them you. Are, don't have openings or they're not for teens specifically. A, so yeah. I don't know, do you guys subscribe in your account to the William James referral? No, it's me. Okay, so you okay. <laughs> yes. so there you go. Here, I'll say this because I'm a therapist. I'm not, I'm not seeing clients anymore now. But I would say it's really hard to find a good therapist. And when you said that good therapist is really booked. If you're looking for a therapist for your child, here's your resource. The schools are a resource. Make sure that therapist has specific experience with that issue and specifically with that population. Someone who deals with adults around anxiety may not be so skilled at dealing with a young person around anxiety. It's really hard to do it. So you have a resource here and in the schools. Um, here's what I do. I, when I, 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 had a, uh, I can't remember what I was doing. I think I was looking at, at some, some kind of home repair. I emailed 10 of my friends and I said, does anybody know, you know a good home repair person? Everyone, people like to help other people, and if you're courageous enough to say, I'm looking for someone, if you trust the people you're sending it to, that can be really helpful. It's really hard to find a good therapist. I have to tell you, I know so many really bad therapists, and I always say to people going to therapy, if you don't like your therapist, find someone else. Think about this. Very few of us, the first person we dated, did we marry? For a good reason. All right, because we have to find a good match. I don't know if you have. There's also a website um, called zencare.co. They are in um, Greater Boston um, right now, and they do a little bit of outside Boston. That you can filter it by like your insurance, or if you don't have insurance, um, how much are you going to pay um, for most of them? You can also set up a free 10-minute phone call with the therapist to see if you're a good match, and they will only show you people that have openings as well. So you say with Zencare, the Zencare.co. Um, like John said, finding a therapist is very hard. Um, and especially in a city and in like a place close to a city where there is a large population of people that are looking for therapists and not as many therapists as we really need, to be quite honest. I um, personally compare it to trying on shoes because you really have a difficult time doing it. You're, sometimes you'll try on like just one shoe and not even get the other like shoe on because it doesn't fit. And I say that because I did actually once walk out of the therapist's office and of into the session because I told him my friend died by suicide and he uh, pulled out a textbook and started reading a chapter on why people die by suicide. And I was like, I know why. I was like, I'm the one that needs help. Like she, she's already dead. Like I need help now, thank you. Um, I found my um, therapist actually because she was the first one that didn't give me the pity look. And for any of you that have ever told somebody that you lost a loved one or that you had a diagnosis of something and they give you that look like that kind of like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Like that kind of thing. Um, I was so sick of it and instead of it, I just told my therapist my laundry list of stuff I wanted to deal with and she's like, Oh well, fuck, I guess we got a lot of work to do. And I was like, yep, just found my therapist. I've been seeing her for about four years now, so <laughs> she's fantastic. Psychologytoday.com, too, yes. is also really good because you can um, see photos of the therapist, yeah. which is helpful. 
Well, it matters. Them. It matters a lot. When my yes. daughter wants to see a therapist, or we're on camera, I'll say, "Well, when do my children want to see a therapist?" <laughs> <laughs> Having that therapist be young and cool looking yeah. was very important to her. Yeah. It's incredibly important to her. So if I knew, like, I, I, you could find a good therapist who is 65, 70 years old, would not have worked. Right. But yeah, I think the pictures are really good. And this William James referral system, if you're not from this community, is called Interface. If you're in a town that subscribes to that and I, I yeah. can, I, you know about that? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So if you are in a town, or maybe this town will think about that, it's been an incredible resource. We did it need them. I helped Lexington with that. But basically, you call up, you tell your insurance, you tell your issues, and they will find you three therapists that they had vetted and talked to. We have room for a couple more quick questions. Yes. Um, just when you had mentioned about your dad and depression, it made me think of, you know, we talked a lot about the young people, but also the elderly and, you know, our parents who are having a lot of issues. And do you have any resources about being mindful? I don't know your organization's called them mindful, yeah. but about you know being mindful and um, you know relaxation type thing. But also you know there's this constant. I lost this. I lost that. I can't find this. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much anxiety. Yeah. So I've done some trainings in seniors. First of all, seniors have something called the friends line because guess what? You can't really call it a suicide prevention line. That generation doesn't go over very well. Yeah. We also know the completion rate for suicide for the elderly is off the charts. Part of that is because they're more frail. So something that would end a life for a young per for an older person wouldn't for a younger person. I'm dealing with a situation now with my dad. My mom recently passed, and my dad, he doesn't want to live. And I actually feel like one of the best things I can do as a son, not as a therapist, as a son, is to be there with him in his pain as opposed to take away the pain. Now, my sisters are not therapists, and they keep telling me that I'm crazy and we should take away dad's pain. But I think being with someone in their pain can feel very supportive. It is an incredibly terrible time of life. You know, the whole thought of like living to 93 sounds great until you're 93 like my dad who just lost his wife for 68 years and really has no mobility. So it's really tough. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you afterward about some things too, but I've done some training. I can give a plug for North Reading. We're doing a senior self-care presentation at the Senior Center on June 27th. If you know a senior that would like to right. go, 1045. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> Yes. Will you be doing the speak in the school for like middle school and high school kids to hear? Um, it was wonderful. I would be willing. Yeah, we can look into it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in a lot of schools. It's funny. So mind your mind this year. This will just. I can't even believe it. We'll do 300 presentations. Oh, wow. It sounds like a lot. Oh, we're like a factory. Well, you got a really good sense of Jenny. you got a good sense of me. Uh, we do this a lot, but we like doing it. Um, and we're doing quite a bit this week. We're yeah. working together quite a bit. Three um, times this week. Three times. We, we love each other now, by the end, we won't be. Um, <laughs> we would love to be in the schools, and that might be a parent night. It could be Jenna coming in to speak to students. Uh, we love doing that, and uh, we're just so happy to be here. But. Oh, I think one more question. Yes. You do presentations that aren't in the evening. I've yeah. got a, a support group for parents raising grandchildren. Yeah, so all, yeah, so all you need to do is to contact who? Ah, there it is. Michelle at Mind Be Your Mind. If you go to Mind Be Your Mind, that website, and you go to book a speaker, it's really easy to she do. It's very wonderful to yeah. communicate with. Yeah. yeah, it's really great. So before I finish, I just want to thank you, Laura, for thank having us here. Thank I, you. I, Workers are really important in all facets. I actually do a lot of trainings. I was telling Laura in public libraries all across Massachusetts. As you can imagine, public libraries, people come in there with all sorts of mental health needs. So I do some of that. We're happy to be here. I was here a couple years ago. Maybe we'll be back. Um, and we will hang out if people have questions. And thank you guys for giving us your evening. Thank so you. Great thank you, everybody.